to give the ordinary world a chance and to let the ordinary world be the means of grace to you. A world that is dangerous, a world that is terrifying. To wake up in that world and to have a capacity for that way of being awake is, it seems to me, great blessedness. If we learn this, then I think we might one day also be granted our noon of heavenly lightnings or our night of fire. The important thing is that we get back home to divine ground. And I think we discover, having got back to divine ground, that we really never left home. This is the astonishing thing. stand in front of the modern world now and speak the great perennial truths into it. And the perennial truths are divine ground, that the whole universe had its origin in divine ground. It is a blossoming out of divine ground and is blossoming still in divine ground. And that there is soul, and by soul I mean there is something in me that is older and prior to the elements. There's something in me and in all of you that is older and prior to the sun and to the galaxy and to the universe itself. It is transcendent. of John is in the kitchen at home in the angler. Actually, it's seeing him walk up the yard from the first cottage at the other end. He would pass by the window, his wild woolly hair blowing in the wind, and then he would come in through the wooden half door. He would have to stoop. I remember him having to stoop slightly so he wouldn't bang his head. I guess John was tall, but his presence was also great. So kind of always seemed like a big tall tree coming in through the door. I would run up to him, throw my arms around him in a hug, and I remember the smell, the smell of the barber jacket. And then he would come in and sit at the big wooden table we had in the kitchen at the time. It was a big, raw, organic, unpolished, unvarnished table. And John, being raw, organic, unvarnished, unpolished himself, kind of, I remember at the time, kind of always correlating the two together, like that they were kind of part of the same tree. Well, first encounter was um, out there, actually, on the main road. And so he just cycled past, saw the three cottages, and um, he stopped and he introduced himself. And he was inquiring about, uh, are we letting the cottages, uh, which were kind of, well, they were habitable, kind of just, and we hadn't really thought about it, but Lynn said, uh, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, we'll stay with you. 2002, I walked around Ireland. Uh, I left Galway and had a six-week um, kind of trip planned for myself. And as part of it, I wanted to meet John. Uh, so, yeah, I called in to see him. He said, uh, what are you doing? And I said, I'm uh, walking around Ireland. Yes. And he asked me, he went, oh, OK. And he said to me, are you walking into your own heart? I had known John since I was young. Growing up in my barn, we're both from the parish of my barn. In fact, we're from the, almost the same district, um, townland. And uh, we grew up together. Um, I, I'm about six years older, but uh, we're still 
young at the time. And uh, I, after we, we left we, our school, we went our different ways. I never met John again until he had come, already come back from Canada and was beginning his sojourn in Connemara. But he had come to Kerry a few times and he came to a store to do a talk for the first time, I think, in North Kerry, home place. And uh, I was asked to introduce him, and I did. And we talked about being neighbours and so on. And I, I, I used to remember when they, they had a field that side of the road, we had a field this side of the road, and we'd be saving the hay together, waving at each other across the road and so on. Well, I used to see John walking up and down cars for terrace, and they used to say the most terrible things about him, uh, like the um, chaplain in there. He was sitting in the great hall. He was, oh, that's a dangerous man, you know. Uh, into but he, what he wanted to do, and now I know I'm going off course now. He wanted to introduce a young poet to the great John Moriarty, who by repute was a creator of all kinds of dubious things like parties with women. Women! No. Women were not allowed, you see. In the young years of John Moriarty, he was already 21, 22, uh, dear Cardinal O'Connell had already given him his degree. I have made a cradle boat for you, my child. May you grow to a great old age. Of the sun's rays I made the back, of black clouds I have made the blanket, of rainbow I have made the bow, of sunbeams I have made the side loops, of lightnings have I made the lacings. Of river mirrorings have I made the footboard, of dawn have I made the covering, of light on high horizons have I made the bed. I remember the bedtime stories being incredible. Actually, sometimes when John was babysitting us, he would have told us such an amazing story that I would pretend to go to sleep. He would then leave the room and go downstairs and continue writing or reading or whatever he was doing. And then a little while later, I would go downstairs and pretend that I had a nightmare. So he would come back up again and tell me another story. On the 1st of June last, um, the 10th anniversary of John Moriarty's death, Lynn invited um, a number of his friends to come together to to remember him in her uh, beautiful house, the Angler's Return in Connemara. And uh, it was a very special occasion. Many of us hadn't met, some of us knew each other before, some, some of us hadn't, hadn't met some of the others, but had heard of them. And it was a, a very special occasion. And I just wrote this little poem in, uh, to celebrate it really. It's called The Twelve Bends and it's, it's, it's for Lynn. The twelve bends yesterday morning, striding in their shawls of rain, and later sun-blasted, and today dappled under running clouds. I begin to understand why we love them, not just their hard grey, white and blue beauty, but also their companionability as they pose together in a semicircle behind the lake, like a group of friends, arms around each other's shoulders as we did yesterday, smiling at the camera, remembering our late great friend who loved the Glen Cohen horseshoe, loved to name the mountains, Derry Clare, Ben Lettery, Ben Gore, who brought us together yesterday at a blue and white house with seven doors. John started gardening here at the Anglers in the early 70s because he'd been living in his head so much in the cottage and he felt he need, needed to touch soil and make contact with the earth. I remember the day he dug his first spade into the ground behind the cottages there where he started a wonderful vegetable garden. Oh, he was so vigilant with his weeding and he taught me how to use a hoe. 
As he was changing and transforming, so was the garden changing so beautifully. He did amazing work there, landscaping and putting in paths and drains and trees. And one huge job I remember was clearing the large rocks that protruded all over the orchard. John had called them nunataks, which he explained is the Inuit word for rocky mountain peaks that protrude thousands of feet above the Arctic ice. But he did leave one tall, shapely standing stone, which we still call John's Rock. It's his nunatak. I remember climbing Dorada Hill with John it wasn't just a stroll up a 400-foot hill. It was talk of schist and gneiss and gabbro with its richness of heather and firs and rock wall and woodcock and ponies and sheep. And always St Dabiox Heath. John gave Dorada Hill this majesty. You'll be climbing back millions of years when you climbed with him. You know, with John we were challenged and made to rethink all our values. And then with Mochina Holleran's presence too, well, the whole world felt sorted. I miss them being around so much. Very often when I've climbed Dorada Hill, there are great, on the south side of that hill, the southwestern side of the great rocks, tremendous rocks there sitting on the sides of the hill, bre broken away from the bedrock. Some of them, some cliffs as well, smaller cliffs. It isn't a tall hill, but um, it seems like maybe the ice hedge has left some great rocks there behind, some great fragmented rocks. And on the way up, very often I would stand in front of one of these rocks and I would put off all my knowing, put off all my knowledge and stand there undefended by my knowing in the presence of this rock. I would put off all my geological knowing and all my chemical knowing and my geographical knowing, put off all my knowing and stand there. Because in Connemara, I very often found that when I would go out into nature, it was my own knowing that I was meeting. I wasn't meeting the reality that was beyond my knowing. I was outstanding in front of a rock, and what I was seeing and meeting was my own geological reading of that rock, my own geological knowing of the rock. But in some sense, my geological knowing of the rock came between me and the rock. I guess I was about three or four and John brought me up the garden one day and he was digging in a patch as he did so much and he um, took out this earthworm. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this but he he's an earthworm. He got it and he just put it on his nose. I just remember him as a child looking at John with this earthworm that was just wriggling on his nose. I don't know what I thought, but I guess it was John's way of, you know, introducing me to the earth and all the creatures in it. He was very challenging, with great, in, uh, great conversations, and he would always arguments, and I didn't always get where he was coming from, and I didn't always agree with him, but and he could be argumentative, and he could be quite dogmatic mm -hmm. and but he was always dignified John was always dignified mm -hmm. and all John wanted was an open fire sit by an open fire and a roof over his head and he was happy but he was a troubled man he was a lonely man within his own head and he did very deep thinking and he was there wasn't a lot of us I mean he had a great sense of humor and he would come down to our level and we had lovely stories and lovely talks and he was, you know, it didn't matter, Tinker, Taylor, Soldier, Spy, whoever he talked to, they were all equal to him, which was lovely. But he did become a really, really good friend and I do miss him. Now when I think of John and there's some nice bright nights and I'm like walking out in the moonlight and I see the moon suspended in the sky in the twinkling stars and I watch the day fade into night and sometimes early morning I'll watch the sun creep over the hill to lighten another day and I know then that I will find John in the rustling leaves the sound of the sea the gurgling of the river bird song children's laughter and I think John would say to us remember me and walk proudly and gently on the earth I heard the owl call my name and uh, he said as well, he's talking about uh, the, the the temples of books yeah, that he had yeah. kind of all around him. And he said, he says, I wonder, are these books protecting me from that view? Yeah. In other words, that yeah. in, it's safe in a sense. Yeah. Not totally safe, but it, yeah. there's a safety in books because yeah. it's all up here. Yeah. But what the mountain is calling you to is 
encounter. When you, when you just think of <laughs> woods and planting, I never forget one night oh, yeah. he came in from with uh, myself and Peter Kerry had been out, and th they brought in all these little hazel, little hazel roots really, and there's a lovely little hazel wood out there at the back, and I suppose I mean. That's one poem, like I went out to a hazel wood because a fire was in my head and cut and peeled a hazel wand and John was saying hooked a berry through my, uh, my, my head. And when white moths were on the wing and moth like stars were flickering out, I threw the berry in the stream and caught a little silver trout. And every time John would say that, oh Jesus, like he jumped like with the excitement of some kind of simplicity. When you were born, Lorna, John was here in the cottage. And Nicky McClintock had come in to stay here with me for the few days because Dad was on the oil rigs, working on the rigs at the time. And then that night I said to Nicky, um, Nicky, she'd just gone to bed and I was just going to bed. I said, Nicky, I think we have to go to Galway. I think you're going to be on the way. Yeah. I had that feeling. Mm -hmm. So Nicky said, oh, you know, up, straight up and uh, downstairs with me. So he, Nicky brought him over, or he came over. And in, I said, John, I'm fine, you know, I'm going off with Nicky now. And I said, go off, go off into Nicky's room, it's warm and nice. And no, Jesus, no, he said, I won't. I won't go to bed. He said, I, I, I might not hear her wake up. I might hear Sarah wake up. Mm -hmm. I'll sit here in the chair by the fire. I flew in and out of John's life like a swallow, I wish as gracefully. I came to know him well over three summer times when we both lived in one of the cottages at Lynn's. And yes, I did love him. He was funny, kind, gentle, and a great listener. He did help to straighten out my head at times. As he would say, I hear you, Nicky, and I'm on this journey with you. He could, and he did, give great comfort. Like all the people who cross our paths that we grow to love, naturally, they broaden our spectrum in some tiny or big way it adds to our sense of being and, and how we perceive the world. John was one such person. I knew him very simply as a neighbour and dear friend in his Dorado West days. My honouring of him is to keep it simple. He lives on with all of us who have loved him. Soon after I came to Derriad, which is over 30 years ago now, uh, one day he said to me, Nicky, I hope the full generosity of the hills you walk will walk with you into wonder. I thought it beautiful and very John. He was a lovely man and I'm glad he crossed my path. Martin was a neighbour of mine over beyond the Cahills. He was living beyond the Cahills. And Martin was one of these old Connemara men, you know, who would always announce his coming. He'd be talking to his dog or fighting with the dog or he'd be saying something to himself or reciting a bit of poem or singing a bit of song or set up a whistle that he'd be doing something because he would never just arrive in on top of you. Martin was one of my great teachers. Martin was a great, great teacher. He, in some sense, really initiated me back into rural Ireland. Yeah, I came here in uh, February of 1983. I came into the, to work in Ballinahinch Castle. At that time, there was a kind of a core group of customers that came into the bar. Mm. And at the centre of that, um, I think, and looking back on it now, was Martin Holloran, you know. Um, his presence uh, just seemed to put, um, uh, for an older man, it seemed to put in a huge sparkle of electricity into the whole discourse, conversation, uh, how the evening would go. And he was just a great man of learning. Um, and I often thought, you know, Marching, I don't know what age Marching left school, uh, but probably at a very young age, maybe 14. I don't think he went on to secondary school or mm -hmm. anything like that. Um, but that didn't matter. Mm -hmm. uh, his, his joy in words and in communication and in conversation uh, was all-encompassing. Uh, and I think that's what John Moriarty um, uh, recognised and loved in marching. You know, I think of um, uh, Samuel Johnson and Boswell and, and mm -hmm. people like that. You know, you see mm -hmm. these famous kind of literary partnerships and Samuel Taylor Coleridge and Keats and all these people that knew each other, uh, literary partnerships. There was a marvellous intellectual link 
friendship, real friendship mm. as well, mm. uh, which is very important. Through the rounds, is he? Because he'd go to the first cottage, that was his first port of call, then to John Moriarty, and if he had time, he would, uh, he would, uh, was he yeah, ban the hinch? You see, he'd scrounge a lift, he'd scrounge a lift from us uh, or from somebody passing by to go to ban the hinch so he could fuel up, get the, get, you know, get some drink. God love him. He, 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 him and drink were just, as I said, he was like pouring water into a barrel of sawdust. He could drink, and I've seen it so many times, five, six pints of Guinness straight off, plus whiskey chasers, and he'd be just in fine fettle. He'd just be, he'd just be in top gear, whereas most of us would be under the table, not this fella. And the weight, you know, he was 90 pounds soaking wet, and you think, where in the name of God do you put this, ten, you know, six, eight pints of beer, uh, which he did on a nightly basis. But multiply that by 50 years. So he had this absolute to a fine art. And the drink was never, occasionally he'd get absolutely oiled and you couldn't, you couldn't understand him. But most times, Martin Holleran was at his best with just a, couple of pints, you know, a few pints of beer. That's enough, that's enough. You're trying to wean him off the beer and maybe give him an odd glass of whiskey just to, just to top it up because that was when you got the best out of Martin Holland. And of course, if he had too much, he went over the threshold and he kind of lost the plot. But So that was part of his nightly ritual. Uh, the spotter, John Moriarty, Van <laughs> Hinch. Oh, I've got carried now. I spent a lot of time uh, by the rivers and uh, on the mountains meditating, I think, without really realizing he was meditating. And one day he had this extraordinary experience that literally shattered him to his very core. He saw that other worlds other than this world here existed. And I suppose his life prior to this experience hadn't prepared him for this ex mystical experience. So someone eventually told him about a Carmelite priest who was here in Dublin on a break. And he said, this man has been through the fire, meaning he was a mystic, and he'll be able to help you. So John revealed his soul to him, told him his story. And he said to John, you need to come back now with me to the Carmelite monastery in Oxford. So he did. John went back with him and he lived a monastic life. He attended matins, prayer, the mass, etc. And he also gardened for them. At that time, he, John needed the protection of a prayerful environment. He was like this new embryo that was born out of this experience needed protection. And he got all that from living the monastic life with the monks for the year. So then he came back uh, and of course he studied all the great te texts of East and West, Buddhism, Hinduism, Zoroastrianism, the Hebrew prophets, the Christian of course, mystics and uh, many other traditions. And he found that the mystics of all the traditions named his experience. And the great impact he had was he had a brilliant intellect, but as well as that, he had this deeply profound spiritual side to him now. We live in a world of terrible fixed species and Berlin walls between all the species. All our personalities, all our natures are really masks in a way. So I love this sense that the species, far from being fixed, they are interchangeable. And if, if I am just my person, my empirical personhood, that is really a mask assumed for the moment by the one great spirit. There is one universal great spirit and it wears many masks and the masks are interchangeable. If the Christian story wishes to be the great story it is, or any story, any story that wishes to be a great story it must literally include everything. I mean, there's no point in just being ecumenical towards Protestants and Catholics to be ecumenical towards Protestants. We have to be ecumenical towards animals, and we have to be ecumenical. We can only be ecumenical towards animals when we're ecumenical towards the animal in ourselves. 
He lives rather isolatedly within a panorama of mountains, which includes a glimpse of just one of the Paps of Danu, Prahich Nanan, a special object of veneration for him. Being taken for a walk by John Moriarty is like being taken for a walk by a mountain, and we strode out mightily, blown along by a gale of talk. A grey and wind-raked mountain ash or rowan, where the way begins to steepen, marks the point beyond which John feels it would be presumptuous to go. It was still only the middle of the afternoon when we reached the road and houses. A few people were leaning on their cars outside the school waiting for the children to come out. A man recognised John's face from a recent TV programme and we stopped to talk. John told them where we had been. But we didn't go beyond the Rowan tree, he said. And do you know why? In the booming rhetorical mode he sometimes ad uh, adopts uh, to cover the shyness. Because it's holy ground. The man inspected him for a moment, and then, in a voice that gave no clue as to the presence or absence of irony, replied, There's a lot of holes in it, right enough. It is only in commonage consciousness that the earth can be saved. We have to take down the fences between us and animals. We have to take down the fences between us and stars. We have to acknowledge the oneness of consciousness that is in the universe. If we don't, we're going to be still in that world of us and them, and they are inferior and we are superior. If we could only once break back into commonage consciousness, then we had a chance. We would be incredibly enriched. We would be so stupendously enriched, and so would the animals be enriched. He talked a lot about, we discussed a lot about what God is, the existence of God. Not so much that he was convinced of, of, of God's existence, but what is God? And uh, we talked a lot about that and he was trying to um, tr trying to explain to me how, what was in his head, but he couldn't quite put words on it. That often happened between us. Uh, but he, he mentioned once, and this comes to me, I often use this myself, when you think you have God down to size, as it were, in the palm of your hand, that's when you don't have him at all. John Moriarty was with us for uh, most of my young life, um, 20, 25 years. He did influence me in a lot of ways when I was in my 20s, going into my 30s, um, of being a very um, a very stable, a stable person. I, I come from a family of four daughters. So this was like, John Moriarty became almost the, the, the brother I never had. So I confided in him in some ways, and he confided in me in, because you see, my path was different to his. I was working in the oil field, uh, and uh, so half of my life I was away. And that we had two children, Sarah and Lorna, uh, and he he would he saw more of them than I did. Would you believe? Because half their lives I wasn't there. He was still a very very strong, powerful influence in my thought process, in my thoughts and my approach to life really and um, I'm always grateful to him for that. John's message you know to me was sometimes slow down slow down a little bit and mm. um, stop mm. look around uh, and John taught me that you know mm. uh, allow yourself space for yourself allow yourself silence for yourself and allow yourself the space to be with those people who are really important to you. And that was a lesson that John gave me. I went to university in, in Brighton, in England. I did a, a, an art degree, and at the end of the, the three years, you had to put on an exhibition. And um, actually, my, my thesis was something that John had helped me to, to write and was there throughout my whole time of putting it together and, and I, I guess you could say he was like my mentor throughout the whole time. So that's why I named the final piece Nostos after him. But John passed away 
uh, on the night I was opening my exhibition, the very, very time actually, the exhibition of the piece that he had been mentoring, mentoring me the whole way through, he passed away that exact time. 7 p.m. 1st of June, 2007. I was walking behind Junior Daly's coffin. Up a narrow winding terrace street in Gold City in the rain on the first day of June. And my mobile phone went off in my pocket. Mary Hughes, in her hushed voice, informing me that 12 minutes ago, John Moriarty had died in his house on the mountain in Kerry. By the time the cortege had reached the top of the hill and was entering the west door of the North Cathedral, Junior Daly had been joined by John Moriarty. Oh, these deathbeds, women heard a visionary white sea bird lamenting that a man should die. And with that cry, I raised my cry. always make you feel so at ease and he'd come in and somebody put, put me on his lap and he'd start singing or whistling a tune and he had the most beautiful whistle I can still hear it to this day I've never heard a whistle sound so tuneful as John's and he'd sing away and I'd apparently mind his singing beside him <laughs> I wouldn't know any of the words and I still don't but I remember him singing and We'd sing, sing together. It's such a, yeah, beautiful voice, John. You want another one? That we sing that one now. I know, John, no. You want it better. Art is a long way better. Oh, it's your wife here. Go on, uh, go on, John. Well, you do it, you do it, John. I'm going to sing it. 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 Oh, that's a lovely one, John. Oh, Jesus. I'm going to sing it. I'm going to sing it. What, man? Should it not be to read that? Go on, John. That's a very good one. On a bright St. Patrick's Day, on the sea a ship was lying for her lover going away. Three Three leaves I long to free when there's brighter days in Ireland. I'll come home and marry thee. Mother, John. Up at the back, and I walked over to John. He said, Christ Jesus, Paul, how are you? And so I said,
Connemara River air it flows through time and tide it meanders its way to see I was a girl there born in a small harbor town where I found was a young lad, open sky, blue eyes. We would wander the shore, he and I, alone. At every moon tide, kneeling down by my side, he would give i